Okay. Hi everyone, uh, uh, my name is Tong Chai College School. Uh, I'm an uh, iOS engineer at uh, Rakuten Wiki. And today I'll be talking about uh, writing high performance Swift code. So let's get started. So for the agenda today, uh, I'll be covering three topics. The first one is uh, uh, the dimensions of performance. The second one is uh, struct versus class. And the last one is uh, about the compiler optimizations. So, on the first topic, uh, dimensions of performance. <laughs> so, uh, when you hear the word performance, uh, uh, dimensions, you uh, dimensions of uh, like something you you might be thinking of. Uh, it might be consist of many multiple uh, stuff to consider about, and it might look something like this when you see it for the first time, like. This might be uh, too uh, complicated to understand, but actually, for performance, uh, there's only three key uh, dimensions to consider, which are the, the location, reference counting, and method dispatch. So let's look at the first one, allocation. So on one side we have uh, the stack, and on the opposite side we have uh, the heap. So what is a stack allocation? Stack allocation is uh, like a normal stack uh, data structure. Is it? It is a last in, first out data structure, which means that you can uh, only write or edit at the end of the stack. So uh, the steps to uh, allocate the memory is just uh, to decrement or increment the stack pointer. So it. The good thing about uh, stack allocation is it is very fast because it is literally a cause of assigning an integer. But the drawbacks is, uh, like for example, it, the size and the lifetime is somewhat fixed, uh, which uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, because uh, the stack memory is uh, allocated like on top of each other. So it is quite hard for you to uh, change the size after you have allocated uh, the memory. <laughs> and usually the stack memory is deallocated when, it, you, when you go out, out of the uh, function scope. So you can't control much of its lifetime. And so the example of uh, stack allocation is uh, struct and enum. And on the other side, uh, we have a heap allocation. Heap allocation uh, requires uh, the use of a more advanced data structure. Uh, the, so the, the step is a bit more complicated, uh, whereby you have to search for an used block of memory of appropriate size to allocate. And to deallocate, you have to uh, reinsert that block back to the appropriate position. So clearly there's more involved here. And uh, the good thing about uh, this is uh, the, the lifetime and the size it can be more uh, dynamic. Like uh, you can uh, force uh, the heap memory to uh, deallocate like, uh, like how you want it to be. So uh, because of the, this data, at more advanced data structure, it is slow. It is slower than uh, using uh, the stack allocation. And there are some uh, threat safety overhead because uh, multiple threads can allocate uh, memory on the heap at the same time. So uh, you have to uh, the OS have to uh, enforce locking or other synchronization mechanism to make it safe. So a a an example is a class. So this is uh, the, an example of. Uh, struct allocation where we have a struct uh, point with uh, x and y. So you can see here that uh, we create uh, the point 1 and assign it to point 2. In the stack memory, we uh, so we have two uh, points side by side in the stack, so not much here. And then and when we uh, assign x to point 2, we only uh, modify the value of point 2 and the point 1 is the same. Uh, as opposed to uh, using a class, so we have the same data structure, 
but now we, we change from struct to class. Uh, uh, here the stack memory is still involved, but we also have the mem uh, heap allocation. So the stack uh, actually has the pointer pointing to the heap, which point one and point two uh, points to the same uh, heap memory. So when you will edit point two, the point one get modified also. So uh, next uh, about reference counting. So you might be uh, thinking that reference counting is only uh, about incrementing and decrementing uh, a number, but there's actually more to it. So that's uh, when you compile code with reference counting, uh, the compiler actually uh, have to insert retain and release calls, uh, uh, retain and release function calls to your code. And as I mentioned with uh, the heap allocation, so there's threat safety overhead because this did these uh, retain and release calls has to be uh, atomic. So there's more uh, threat uh, safety overhead here. So, so as an example, for the same uh, class uh, point, when you compile the code from on the left side, um, you can see on the right side that the, the compiler actually generates uh, more code than you can see. So it has a uh, reference count inside and also there are uh, multiple retain and release calls generated. And compared to struct, um, there's no retain and release call uh, generated so it is uh, so less is involved here so it is uh, faster. And um, next um, method dispatch so this is uh, the third uh, dimension. So, so static method dispatch is just uh, just just a normal uh, method call. So nothing fancy here. So, I, but I want to uh, focus on the dynamic dispatch. So this usually happens when you have uh, inheritance or uh, protocol uh, classes where uh, there can be cases that uh, at runtime you don't know what actually what is the actual uh, type of that the protocol or the superclass is representing. So uh, it has to look at, uh, at a table at runtime to see what is what is the actual implementation is. Which uh, this table looking is not a big uh, overhead, it is just one more level of uh, indirection. But uh, I want to focus here that uh, dynamic dispatch uh, prevents uh, inlining and optimi other optimizations that uh, would otherwise be visible to the compiler. And I'll, I'll be uh, demonstrating inline, inlining later. <laughs> so, uh, for example, of uh, the dynamic dispatch. So here we have uh, a drawable uh, cl super class, and we have point and line subclasses. And we have a drawable uh, um, array. So you can see it uh, at runtime, because the array can contain either point or line, so it has to look at the table on the right side here, whether the actual element is a line or a class. And when you call draw for that object, it, it, by looking at the table, it can actually jump to the correct implementation. OK. Um, for the first topic, what I want to uh, leave for you guys is when you when you think what you should think when writing Swift code, uh, you should uh, you should uh, ask yourself these uh, questions: whether should the instance be uh, created on the stack or the heap, and when passing the instances around, how much reference count are you uh, incurring? And when, uh, when you call the method, is it going to be statically or dynamically dispatched? And as a general rule of thumb, you, you don't want to pay for the dynamism you don't need. Okay, for, for the second topic, uh, struct versus class. <laughs> so I, I think you, you guys might be uh, running into this situation a lot where you want to this, whether you don't uh, chew with whether you want to use a struct or a class for your data. <laughs> so when I hear about uh, 
Swift at the first time and with the introduction of value types and structs, uh, I have this uh, thought in my mind. Like uh, structs are very fast. I should you I should be using it everywhere. <laughs> and can I ask who in this uh, room has also have this uh, idea? Okay, a few people. And um, actually, this is not always true. <laughs> and so let's let's look at uh, a simple example. So things get quite uh, a bit more complicated when you have a struct with uh, reference types inside. So I have a quick uh, quiz here. So uh, as a question, uh, when I pass this uh, struct around, what will happen to the text and font variables inside? We would get a uh, copy each time, each time I uh, pass it around. Or when, or, uh, or if uh, each of it will be uh, reference counted, or nothing will happen. Uh, <coughs> so uh, who, who thinks it's uh, A? Everything get, gets copied. And, and who thinks it is B? Oh, <laughs> so, uh, in normal circumstances, it is actually uh, B. So, as an example, here I create one label with a string and font, and I assign it to label two. So, when I compile the code, it's actually it is actually retained and re releasing each uh, of the labels. Each, oh, sorry each of the properties uh, inside the label. So you can imagine if you are using a class instead of a label here, when you pass it around, then there would be, you, you, uh, the compiler would only have to increment or decrement the reference count of the class. But here, we, it is actually increment or decrement the reference of the, each properties inside. So it is, like two times more uh, expensive than what a class would have. Mm -hmm. And there's another case with uh, when you are using large value types inside a protocol type collection. So, so when you have a protocol type collection, right? It, because protocol can hold, uh, it doesn't know what is the actual uh, type is. It it uses this, this uh, technique called uh, uh, exist existential container where uh, it stores a, a pointer to the actual uh, memory inside the heap. So here we have a, a, struct, a pair with uh, two uh, protocol types like drawable. So when you copy the pair uh, like uh, in here when you assign the pair to the copy, it actually copies the whole struct. So instead of like, uh, if you are using, if you use class, it would be like only one uh, reference count increase, right? But if you have uh, a struct, in this case, it, uh, it would uh, copy <coughs> the, the whole struct. <coughs> and as you can see, it, it is very, it would be very expensive if you have something like this. Okay, so for, for those, from those two examples, I want to highlight that when you use structs, you have to be careful when there's a class. If there's a class inside, you can uh, be uh, causing excessive uh, reference counting overhead. And for protocol type collections with large struct inside, uh, it can cause uh, excessive uh, copying. So I, I, I forgot to mention one thing from the previous slide. So, the existential container actually has uh, about uh, three uh, value buffer size of three words. So if, if your uh, struct is size is less than uh, three words, it, then it will it can be stored uh, right inside the existential container without allocating the heap. But here for the line we have uh, four words, so it has to allocate an, uh, a heap memory outside. Okay, so what, 
with all those uh, information, you might be thinking, okay, fine, I have uh, like lots of data and protocols everywhere, and uh, so trucks will usually will be always too slow for me, and I'll just use class everywhere. <coughs> but actually, you don't have to lose your hope yet. We have uh, this thing called uh, copy and write technique that uh, can uh, basically go around uh, all these pitfalls. So what is copy and write? Copy and write is, uh, it is uh, basically a struct with internal class storage, which we manually uh, copy when we mutate the, the struct. So as an example, we have this uh, line struct here. <coughs> and inside, we actually uh, declare a storage of line, called line storage, which is actually a class. And when we call the move function, which is uh, changing the, the data inside, uh, we check if, uh, if we are the only person to who hold the reference to this storage. <coughs> if, it, if we are not the only one, then we create a copy. <coughs> so the checking is done by calling this uh, function called is uniquely reference non-objective C which uh, you might think that it looks ugly, but, uh, <coughs> but luckily uh, we don't always have to do this. Uh, Swift standard library uh, array sets and dictionary uh, already implements uh, this copy and write functionality for you, so you can use it uh, directly. Okay, so, so to summarize, uh, uh, when you should use a uh, struct or when you should use a class. <coughs> so uh, for struct, uh, so you can use it when comparing the data makes sense, like comparing x and y value of uh, two points. <coughs> and or when you want uh, each copy to have independent states or use it across multiple threads. Example is, yeah, just uh, what you see before, the, like points, size, or coordinates. <laughs> and for class, uh, you can use it when uh, comparing the identity of each instance makes sense. Like, for example, you're comparing uh, two UI views because you are not, uh, you won't be comparing like the frame or background color of each views, right? You just compare the two pointers. And if you are working with Cocoa Framework, then uh, most of the APIs is, uh, ex expects you to pass an X object anyway, which is a class, so you can get around it most of the time. So, and like personally, I find that uh, I, I'm using more class than struct because it has like very uh, little use case. <laughs> so most of the time, I, we just have to use class. Okay, for the last topic, uh, compiler optimization. So why, why, why do I want to talk about this? Uh, so once upon a time in Stack Overflow, I look, uh, I was looking up like um, a function to calculate uh, the distance between uh, two point co Earth coordinates. Um, and I saw this, uh, Defined here, this, uh, this macro here, which, which is uh, <coughs> I'm dividing the pi with one, uh, 180. So, uh, what is, uh, so I suggested that why, why don't you just uh, replace this pi divided by 180 with a constant? Because pi is a constant, right? Dividing with a constant is just another constant, so you can just use a number to save some uh, uh, computation time and the code program faster. And I made this uh, suggestion on uh, 2011, <laughs> and uh, five years later, uh, somebody told me that uh, you don't need to do this because uh, the compiler actually calculates this term for you. So, yeah. So at the time, I get confused, <laughs> basically. So, so do I really don't need to do this? The only way to check this is uh, is to test it. So I'll be 
uh, we're testing this uh, and see if it is true or not. And, okay. So, okay, so I have, I created a Swift file called demo, and inside this file, I just have two variables, A and B. A is uh, the same thing as we, ha as we have before, and B is uh, the constant, which is a res uh, which is means to be the result of the computation of the pi over 180. So what we can do is So we have to compile it and see what the compiler actually throws out. Then you can do this by uh, uh, no, not this now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can do this by uh, using C. Uh, <laughs> So can you you can compile it using XC run Swift C and then you pass on the name of the file and you can uh, specify right uh, there. So the dash O none here is uh, you is telling the compiler that you don't want to do any uh, optimization and this is just the out, name of the output. So we will do this and see what will happen. So, so we have our output here, and this is an uh, executable file, so we won't be able to read it, but we can read it actually using a tool called uh, Popper Disassembler. So let's fire it up. <laughs> and I just want to try the demo. Uh, you can just drag and drop this executable to the hopper and boom, we have lots, yeah, as you can see we have lots of uh, assembly code which, which we cannot read. <coughs> so our main function is here. Um, but actually you can read the code in, uh, hopper provides you a tool called uh, the pseudo code mode. So you can just highlight the main function <coughs> here and click on that button. <laughs> and you will see uh, like what the compiled code actually looks like. So here for the, uh, the variable A, right? so the first two lines is just uh, uh, the program trying to uh, read the, the main argument. So let's <laughs> skip that. So the third line is actually the A variable. So we can see that uh, it is actually doing some dividing, uh, seeing from the intrinsic SD, which is like uh, stat dividing static uh, double or something. <laughs> and from B is just uh, a number. So I don't know what in XMM1 is, but I think it's just a uh, constant, a number, so it's on. <coughs> so without comp uh, optimization, you can see that there's a divide, division happening. So, but this is not actually the code uh, that uh, you build at, uh, for production. So for release mode, you're actually doing uh, some optimization here. So we actually have to change the the optimization level here to dash O and we will change the name of the output. <laughs> so now we have another output which is uh, optimized so, and let's see if it, if it is uh, different from earlier. <laughs> so let's do the same thing here. So now you see that A and B is actually just a number after uh, you apply the optimization. <laughs> So uh, the last number is just maybe my uh, rounding error. <laughs> um, okay. Um, that's <laughs> okay um, 
actually, I, I also uh, played it a bit further. So I tested it with. Uh, I want to see if it, the compiler would be smart enough to collapse the calculation from a for loop. So we can do the same thing here. Let's see. So yeah, actually C is just a number after we apply optimization. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But it's let's test let's test for a bigger loop and see what happens. Uh, Do the same thing here and here. Oh, uh, so it's not actually a number anymore. It has it actually going through some loop because uh, you can see that the so you can see some overflow checks. And there's a lot of jumping here. So you can see this uh, 1580 here is actually the address on the top. So it's actually going in the loop here. And then <coughs> and it has lots of overflow checks. So it turns out that if the, your for loop is large, then it's, the compiler doesn't collapse it. <laughs> but, but I see there's an overflow check here, and I, I was wondering, and I know that uh, Swift actually has a, a operator that actually ignores the overflow checking, so I'll, I'll try to use that and see if it will produce a different result. And let's go back to here. So now instead of doing this, I'll do this instead. So instead of plus, I'll use ampersand plus, which is like a uh, plus with uh, overflow checking ignored. And let's do the same thing. Uh, oh, yeah, so now it's just a number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just a trick that. Uh, if you want to like crazy fast performance, you can like oh, skip the overflow checking. And if you ever need to do some hard uh, uh, mathematics, okay. <laughs> so yeah, I have a last uh, example I want to show you here, which is uh, inlining. So I'll create a three function which calls each other like function one which call function two, two which call three and three which just random a number. <coughs> so if we compile this one, so let's remove this as not intended. <coughs> and we just call function one here. <coughs> so let's compile it without optimization and then with optimization. So without the optimization you see that inside the main function it actually calls function one. And inside function one oh, it calls function two as we have written. And two in two it calls three and in three it actually and actually in three it actually calls the random function. But for the optimized uh, version <coughs> If you can see in the main uh, function, it actually skips uh, all the function, function calls we have made and it goes straight to the random uh, work. So yeah, so that's uh, what the compiler is doing on your behalf when you use uh, specify the optimization flag. So let's go back to here. So yeah, so we have seen the uh, some example of compiler optimizations uh, and in action, which is a uh, constant folding, inlining, and I haven't demoed the code elimination, but basically it's just uh, notification messenger four minutes ago. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, so it just remove unused code, and uh, if the compiler can detect that uh, some function is not used anywhere, so it just remove it. 
So constant folding uh, is just one of like many many compiler optimizations that you that it is doing behind. So you can check it out in this uh, wiki page if you are interested. So that's uh, all it works. Just if you want to see later. Okay. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And by the way, we are hiring. <laughs> if you are, yeah, if you are interested, please uh, contact this email. And the slides will be uh, in this URL. And you can uh, follow me on Twitter or GitHub. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I just want to say, do you do any benchmarking, for example, between instructs and classes? I know in theory it's supposed to be like faster, as you say, but in uh -huh. practice, like what is the speed difference? Uh, yeah, it's quite hard to tell, but I, I haven't done uh, that myself. But I, I think you can use uh, the time profiling to like and switch around uh, like between the two implementation and see what the the time is, but yeah, I haven't done the actual uh, thing, okay. the testing. Because uh, from what I do know, it's, right, it's okay. true to know what is in theory, but whether in practice is that the bottleneck in your code does or not? Uh, yeah. I think it yeah, depends on how intensive your code is around that using that uh, struct or class, right? Yeah, because uh, the overhead is, if you see like, uh, if you can compare them side by side, it's the function calls uh, overhead from uh, retain and release is going to be quite a lot. And also, if you have, uh, if you access it uh, on multiple threads, then you have like um, track safety overhead. <laughs> so yeah, it depends on the circumstance that you use those data. Okay. How about Again, enum, enum versus struct? Like, enum versus struct? Enum versus struct? Uh, see, they are, I think they are very <coughs> similar, but uh, yeah, but but it's but it's diff, uh, use cases are different, right? but I think both are value types. So performance-wise, I think is about the same. But but yeah, I don't know if they're like. Because you have like different variations of enums, like associated values and all those. I don't know if those will impose more uh, overheads, but yeah. But I think if you use it traditionally, it should be roughly the same performance. Is that answer your question? Actually, have a export plugin or something, right? For example, instead yeah. of like plus, you can suggest like use that or that overflow operator. Mm -hmm. That's what I can think of. Like plugin or something that can suggest to develop developer that this is an alternative way of doing this for higher performance. Oh, oh yeah. So you mean like if you there are some libraries that okay. that. What was it? Sorry, yeah. I'm not sure whether such libraries exist. Such libraries? Oh, uh, yeah. mm, I don't know. Maybe uh, like some graphics intensive will do. Will use those kind of stuff underneath for you, and you don't actually have to use that yourself. But yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Okay. Any other questions? Okay, no then. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay.